Engagers, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights and inspiration to help us in the process of using games and gamification in our daily lives, for example, to learn what we are teaching. And I am Rob Alvarez. I work at Iron Hack, teach at IE Business School University and so much more and host this podcast. If you have an extra second, please go ahead and subscribe for free to our email list at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Engagers, welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game podcast. And we have with us today, Shaunak Roy. Shaunak, did I get your name right? And are you prepared to engage? Yes, very excited to have this conversation, Rob. Yes, that was one of the best pronunciation of my name. It's not an easy name, but as you know. <laughs> well, you know, my second last name, yes, in Latin countries and people who speak Spanish, it tends to be a thing to have both of your last names, like your mom's and your dad's. So my mom's last name is Buholska. <laughs> it's written oh. with C-H. It's Polish. In fact, if somebody is listening to this and is Polish, you will probably know that Buholska is female. <laughs> because it's my mom's and she, when she moved well her parents moved to venezuela she kept her last name and she kept it as female of course which makes sense but then she gave it passed it to me and i have a female last name <laughs> which i don't mind but it's it's a curiosity for especially for polish people when they when they hear my last name so <laughs> there you great go that. great story there <laughs> Absolutely. So, Shanak, welcome to Professor Game Podcast. Engagers, we have Shanak today because he is the founder and CEO of Yellow Dig, which is a community-driven active learning platform that has been adopted by over 130 colleges and universities, K-12 through schools, and corporate training clients. Their mission is to transform every classroom into an active social and experiential learning community. Does that sound any, ring any bells, Engagers? There you go. Because Shaunak has also graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering from IIT Bombay and completed his graduate studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Before founding Yellow Dig, he spent a decade advising global companies on tech strategy and growth. So that, that is a, at least a part of your background, Shaunak. Is there anything we're missing that you want to highlight before we kick off? No, I mean, that's a great kind of a summary of my background. You know, I came from the corporate world and, you know, jumped into entrepreneurship, you know, build up a company, Yellow Dig, that we're going to chat about today. And Gameful Learning is kind of core to what we, in our mission. So, yeah, I'm kind of really looking forward for kind of jumping into this conversation with you. Sounds, sounds absolutely fantastic. So, we like to kick off, you know, understanding our guests. One of the main things we ask is, you know, what is a regular day, regular week? What does being Shaunak in a day like today and this week, whatever you want to go for? We just want to sit on your shoes for a little bit. Well, you know, my day is not unlike most people in this day and age in the pandemic we are living in. So, you know, most of my day is like staring at a screen. I have like three screens in front of me right now. <laughs> so that's what I do. I, you know, I, I get going early in the morning about eight o'clock and then I'm there till like 7, 8 p.m. in the evening doing my thing. You know, being an entrepreneur as a startup founder, it's fun. So it's kind of quite unpredictable, I would say. Like, I would say half of my time is based on what's the fire in that day. Uh, it could be anything, could be client related, could be product related, could be something that we are building that's, you know, meeting a deadline or whatnot. And half of my day is kind of, you know, hopefully some long-term thinking, you know, where we want to kind of take the company, you know, what kind of things we want to build, like, you know, having these kind of discussions around the future of gameful learning and then things like that. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy what I do and uh, it's exciting, I would say. And, you know, as you know, I mean, there are a lot of things happening in education this day and age. So it's kind of, I, I would say I'm quite privileged and happy to be in my shoes. <laughs> There you go. There you go. Pretty interesting. And talking about your company, talking about the experiences you've had, we like to dive right in into, you know, one of the difficult stories. One of those times where, you know, you went into something that you might want to call your favorite fail or first attempt in learning, favorite failure, whatever you want to name this. But the idea is that you were going north, things went south, you know, things didn't go as you planned. We want to be there with you. We want to, you can, you know, go through that experience, take some lessons along the way, and perhaps even see how you got out of that sort of fail moment. Wow. 
You know, I, I love the term favorite failure. You know, when I became an entrepreneur, right, this is the first time I kind of really started to appreciate what it means to be an entrepreneur, which is like almost failing on a daily basis. And then also winning, right? There are these like small failures, hopefully not a big failure that you lose the company, but small failures and small wins, which kind of makes up my day in the life and overall, I mean, and a day in the year <laughs> or whatnot. But from a favorite failure standpoint, you know, I, I would say that what comes to my mind is when I started the company back in the days, you know, 2015, when I quit my corporate job, and I was this like blue eyed entrepreneur, want to kind of transform, change education, build something awesome. And that was my kind of, you know, when I got into it and I realized hmm. the first product that we launched, um, you know, that was, a, I would say, a beta product, but hoping to transform classroom learning and we can get into that what we do. And we never got the engagement. Like the biggest problem that we ran into was you know, like many other entrepreneurs, by the way, I, I think, you know, people in this year audience who have tried to build a company or are building a company right now would kind of relate to this is, you know, when you when you think, when you build something and you, you know, and, and you hope that the users will come and they'll start use the product and actually give you feedback so that you can make the product better. But the hardest thing for me was that even getting the first users engaged on the platform was super hard. I remember the day, you know, we launched uh, the first few pilots in a few courses and I had to beg the professors to kind of say, hey, you know, what do you want to use my product? And they will say, yeah, I'll give it a try. And students will come, hmm. they will come in, they'll make a few posts and comments, but they would not come back. And I used to think that what did we do wrong? Is that something we built the wrong product or is it something that we kind of completely misread the market needs but what it turns out to be, you know, just looking forward is that it is a problem pretty much every, not every, I would say, but a lot of products face in the market, which is how do you engage your users? What's pretty tough, of course, as a young entrepreneur trying to kind of make things happen. And that was probably my step into gameful learning or gamification or kind of thinking about ways to kind of entice our users to come back to the platform so that they can come in and they can engage the first problem to solve to kind of really build a platform around it. So you ran into this engagement problem. You were not getting enough usage. How did you go about it? Like, what did you do? Well, you know, for me, you know, at that point, of course, you know, I was new to building, you know, user experiences and kind of really thinking about gameful ways of driving user experience I would say my first instinct was to go back and start to really observe the behavior of our users on the platform. We started looking at the back end to see that if somebody will come and let's say they kind of interacted with somebody on our platform, would they come back? Or if somebody came back, something we can tell from that behavior, like what got them back into the platform. And what I found is that a lot of the initial product build out that we did was around features and functionalities, which is you know something that we thought would be good for the users. But the thing that we really didn't think about much was the, the behavior or the psychology of the users, like what really gets people engaged. And that was when we kind of came up concepts like, which is very popular now, our game for learning, our point system that drives engagement. We have a patent on it right now. So we've done a whole bunch of work over the years on, on that you know, specific topic. We kind of invented things around nudging. How do we nudge the users at the right time so that they get, can get back into the platform? And some of the initial concepts of Gameful Learning was built around it. And then we kind of kept on iterating around it you know, over the last five years to kind of get to where we are today. Nice, nice. That sounds like a nice experience and hopefully also a segue into our next question, because it's not only about talking about those fail moments. How did you get out of them, which is super interesting and I would say is one of the main questions that we always like to have. But another very important one is, you know, if actually a time where you did, you know, you were set out to do something and you achieved it, whether it was the first or the 10th or the nth attempt that doesn't matter. We want to sort of be in that proud moment with you. We want to listen to that story and maybe find one of some of those, you know, sort of winning factors that got you there. Yeah. So, you know, the winning factor was we kept at it and we kind of iterated around that experience and kind of eventually launched a completely new version of the product back in 2019. 
And that product took off, uh, and especially, you know, during the pandemic, the product around the, the problems around engagement was a big problem, as you know. So a lot of universities reached out to us and they wanted to give it a try. We even offered free pilots to a lot of instructors who wanted to give it a try, but didn't have the budget, so wasn't quite ready. And all of that has um, really kind of, you know, propelled us to where we are today. I mean, today, you know, as you mentioned, you know, we work with over 100 plus universities, about 130 or so, mostly in the U.S., but we have clients in Australia, Singapore, some parts of India now where we are driving, you know, that classroom engagement that is so hard to do. Like if you're an instructor, you might relate to this, which is as classrooms are getting more kind of devolved into, I would say, online or some version of hybrid courses and programs, getting the students engaged on the subject matter is a very hard problem. And I think some of the work that we did, you know, starting those days when we were failing heavily, but then eventually kind of we worked on the solutions now I would say is kind of pay, paying a lot of dividends for us. So we have this approach that seems to have worked pretty well. And we see, I mean, the biggest thing what we see is that a lot of students who, you know, otherwise would say that, hey, you know, I did not really build any relationships in my courses and programs are saying that, oh, I, I built it because Yellowdig was there. I mean, that's kind of very exciting and I would say fulfilling for us as a company. That sounds very exciting. And, and you started off by saying that you did sort of a couple of pivots, you did some iteration. Can you, you know, even if just quickly or, or one of them, what did that look like? Like, what were you doing to arrive to those iterations? How did you how did you get to that? So, you know, in terms of gameful learning, and as you know, there is a lot of work that has happened in, in terms of the research that has done the white gamefulness work. And there are three areas that we, you know, that we found quite useful for us. So, the first day, I would say the bigger problem that we were trying to solve is the problem of motivation. So the motivation meaning why would a student come into a platform like Yellowdig or any other platform of that for that matter and engage? And there is a lot of work in that area. You know, we know now that student agency, where students have the freedom to actually participate in a variety of ways in a platform, matters a lot for them to feel motivated. They want to be connected. You know, students want to feel that they are connected with other learners in their courses or programs. They may be sitting in different parts of the globe or they may be in the same classroom, but they don't know each other, right? A lot of the times. But how do we get them connected so that they are they feel motivated? And the, finally, I would say the mastery piece, which is, you know, students are coming from where they are in terms of their skill level in whichever courses they are part of, but then kind of slowly being able to learn the subject matter as a group with their community is something we found really has an impact in driving motivation. So what we did was, of course, you know, we kind of started to listen to our users, as I kind of mentioned, kind of really see how they were behaving on the platform. And we also started to talk to a lot of instructors who were trying to solve this problem and kind of really triangulated those feedback points to build around the gamification that drives engagement for us right now. And you know, just a little bit more about our gamification. The way it works for us is we have what we call is a point system, which measures engagement on our platform by the student. So as a student will come in and let's say they share a piece of content on our platform where they will, ha let's say they have a question for their peer group or they have a, a new resource that they want to share with their group, they will earn points for that because they actually started a conversation Another student coming in and maybe reacting to that post or comment or maybe kind of sharing a point of view which kind of extends that point of view or kind of gives a counterpoint to that would also earn points. So there is an automatic point system that drives this like engagement in the classroom. A lot of that is driven by participation and some of that is driven by peer feedback. And that essentially what kind of leads to this engaged classroom experience that otherwise sometimes do not come together because it's hard to do I mean, in, in a physical classroom. And, and that's what we have iterated over, over the last five years to kind of really build a system almost that kind of works seamlessly and drives higher engagement, higher retention, higher student satisfaction. Sounds like a lot of fun. Lots of stuff to, to go there. And Shanak, maybe we can go a little bit deeper into this one because I'm sure that the way you're doing things, you have sort of a way of achieving this engagement, a way of using your gameful strategies. When you're about to create one of those, maybe imagine you're creating a new one 
or maybe it's within a lesson, whatever you want to go for. Do you have some sort of process you apply when you arrive to a situation where you want to apply, again, gamefulness, gamification, games-based learning, however you want to approach this one? You know, it's a great question. You know, so the, the way we go about it is we have a strategy, which is, you know, as I said, there are three kind of aspect of gamefulness, which is agency of the student in terms of freedom. They can they being able to kind of choose their own path in the platform, connectedness and mastery. So when we are building a new feature or a functionality, we typically tend to look at is this feature or functionality is going to extend any of those dimensions in the game? Because if it's not, let's say, you know, there is an idea that we want to implement, but that kind of goes against those principles, we would take a deeper look and really try to understand how is this going to help or hurt this whole game full engagement that we are trying to build in the platform. So that's kind of the first filter that we put up. And if you are convinced a new feature or functionality actually is going to help in any of these dimensions or all of those dimensions, for that matter, then we would... Typically, what we will do is we'll take an iterative approach to that because, you know, what we have found is building the best feature, even though it kind of satisfies or checks the box on the best assumption that we had, doesn't always lead to the right outcome. So what we typically do then do is build a minimum viable version of that feature based on those kind of core assumptions and we'll launch into a selected user group. You know, we have an ability to actually launch new features to one or a set of courses or programs, not kind of our entire user base right now. And at that point, you know, we will start to see that, okay, is that right? Like whatever we thought is going to happen, is it really happening in the real world, right? I mean, in terms of data that we are looking in the back end, as well as feedback, right? I mean, are we getting support tickets, which kind of says that, hey, this is not really working or it's kind of creating more confusion in my classroom. So th- that will give us, um, so we, we our feature development is not kind of done unless we kind of get that piece of feedback and then really feel that, okay, this is really hitting the mark. Maybe it needs a little more refinement or improvement, whatnot. And then we kind of start to expand that feature out to our entire user base. If that makes sense, does that answer your question in terms of like how we kind of think about building new features? Yeah, sounds good. Sounds like the, the way you approach at least your feature. So thank you very much for that, Shonak. Just a quick break before we continue with this episode. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I would really appreciate if you share it with your friends and family and on social media. On Twitter and Instagram, it's at Rob Alvarez B and hashtag Professor Game, all one word. And in Facebook, you can find the Professor Game page. Thanks in advance for your engagement. And Sharnak, talking about recommendations and ways of doing things in your experience, is there some sort of best practice, something that at least would make a gameful project a little bit better, a lot better. I don't want to call it a silver bullet. That's always risky. <laughs> but, you know, can you can you give us that sort of recommendation in that sense? You know, there are a couple of things that comes to my mind, which is, you know, I mean, if, I, if you think of the problems about gameful learning or even gamification, the first question comes is that whether that type of gamification is going to drive the right kind of outcome. You know, especially in education and the space that we are in, there is a lot of perception out there, which is, okay, gamefulness may may not be good for students, right? I mean, the the world gamification sometimes has a bad branding behind it. Like people say, hey, don't game the system, right? I mean, (laughs) or is it a popularity contest, right? I mean, this should be a serious learning environment. Are we creating incentives for the learners, which is going to lead to the bad kind of outcomes? I I think... I or the that, negative comment of, this is not a game, guys, come on. Exactly, right? And a lot of teachers uh, that we work with also had some bad experience in the past because they tried something that they thought would be useful, but didn't really you know, lead to the right kind of outcomes for them. So I, I think the first thing in my mind from a best practice standpoint is to kind of really think about how is this gameful learning going to impact from a learning outcome standpoint and have some strategies behind it. I would like to see more work in this area, honestly. Like, you know, there's a lot of work that has happened in learning sciences. We know a lot how people learn from a cognitive standpoint or from a procedural standpoint. There hasn't been a lot of work in terms of kind of combining the gameful learning research with like learning sciences research to kind of really think about are there best practices around gameful learning that are actually good for the students. So 
some of the work we are doing as a company, but I think there could be more work done. I mean, especially depending on one's interest or focus area, there could be some very focused research done in that area. I, I think that's one thing that I would say. The other thing I would say is that we often see sometimes instructors or people who are you know, implementing a gameful approach to a problem over design that experience where, you know, okay, let me do this and then do that. And maybe if this happens, that will happen. If, if that happens, this will happen. It's kind of a big jigsaw puzzle. Sometimes it feels like, and, and, and that what happens in the result is that, you know, the users get overly confused because there are too many factors at play. And, and so my recommendation there is like, if you're adopting any sort of gameful learning, less is more where kind of, kind of trying to implement one thing and truly seeing the behavior patterns and then starting to build around it in an iterative way is something I'll recommend to kind of get to the final outcome that you can control. That sounds very good. Keeping it simple <laughs> would be a way to put it as well. Thank you very much for that recommendation. And Sharnak, you've heard all these questions that we've been discussing. You have at least a sense of what the vibe of the podcast is. Is there somebody in the learning space, in the gamification space, that you would like to listen to in an interview like this one, in Professor Game? Maybe a future guest, maybe a past guest. I know we have hundreds of interviews already, so I'm not sure you went through each and every one of them. So is there anyone, anybody, again, that comes to your mind, whether past or, or hopefully future guest? You know, one institution I've seen, I've done a lot of work in this area, is uh, University of Michigan. You know, we had a podcast we recently did with them. The person we invited was Ben Plummer, who is a learning designer at the Ross School of Business. He had some really interesting insights to share on this topic, which is essentially blending gameful approaches with learning design. Hmm. Somebody, you know, you might be interested to kind of look up. Sounds like a very interesting person to look up for sure. Learning design is always a, a good place to start. We, that, that, that has been controversial every, every now and then people saying, you know, if you're a learning designer, be a learning designer, game designer is a completely different thing or, or a serious game designer and so on. But I do think it is a, a pretty interesting way to, to get started or a place where you can get started into all this. And if he's been dedicating himself to some of this and, and research and actually implementing, it could be a great guest for sure. And continuing with recommendations, is there is there a book that you recommend this audience, the engagers, people who are looking into gameful learning, gamification, maybe not only of learning of, or other things, but again, it could be a book on that or just general inspiration or whatever you want to go for here? Well, I think, you know, I don't have a book recommendation right now, but I would say that if you're interested in, you know, gameful learning, especially when it comes to learning design, a good spot to start is active learning research. There's a lot of work that has happened in kind of really digging into what drives um, active learning for students. Because at the end of the day, what gameful learning does is that drives that active experience, right, for the students. I would recommend like Stephen Kostlin is one person that comes to my mind. He has become a good friend and he has re recently written a book around learning design. If you just look up his name, you will find a bunch of books he has written in that area. So that, that is one thing that comes to my mind. I don't know that's, if that's helpful, Rob, but that's <laughs> kind of what I can think of right now. Sounds very, very good. And we've been talking about recommending other people, recommending something to do. But what would you say in your case is your superpower? At least that thing that you do, that your, your sweet spot, that thing you do at least better than most other people. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I don't know if I have any superpower by that matter. I mean, my, <laughs> my superpower is probably do whatever it takes, right? So as a as a founder entrepreneur, I would say, you know, one thing, you know, I mean, just to kind of go back into my background, right? I do not have any formal background in game research. My, my only background in gamification is essentially playing games, you know, growing up and whatever <laughs> games were there when I was growing up. They were not like so many good games because I have two daughters and, they're playing all sorts of games these days. And I, I'm, I'm amazed by the quality of the games that they're playing, like Roblox or Minecraft and others. I mean, I'm sure your audience is very familiar with. But from my side, I would say the thing that I focus a lot on is observing behavior. I mean, I look at kind of a new application. I always like to see that, okay, these are the features and functionality of, uh, let's say, a game but how do people actually interact with that? Because, you know, what we sometimes think we do and what we actually end up doing are quite different. And a lot of that goes into motivation, kind of incentives and other things. 
And that's something I've been paying a lot of attention, I would say, since my big failure, as I talked about when we launched the company. But yeah, yeah I mean, if that makes sense. And the other thing about observing behavior is, you know, even though it takes a little bit of attention, but it's not that difficult to do. I mean, all it takes is to kind of pay a little bit of time and attention on how users are behaving in our platform. The way we do this is, you know, we, we have a system for our application in the back end. We actually can track every click and we group those clicks by various functionalities in our platform. And, you know, we have chronological, we can look at like, you know, the intensity of that, you know, engagement around that feature and how users are engaging, what kind of journeys they're taking. So we have some tooling around it. So that's what I do. Like I typically will kind of open up a tab and kind of watch users using the application. And what I've seen is that the kind of things I've learned from just watching that is been very valuable in, in kind of, you know, designing or improving those experiences or coming up with new feature ideas. Sounds like the smart thing to do, looking at what people do to figure out what you want them to do and how you want them to do it. So observing that behavior seems to be a superpower in your case, Shaunak. So Shaunak, before we take off, before we, you know, let, let this conversation finish, I'd like to make sure you, if you have any final words you want to leave us with, that would be great. If not as well, let us know where we can find you, where we can find out more about your company, about Yellow Dig, what you guys are doing anywhere again in the world of the internet. Yeah. So, you know, from my side, I'll say, look, I've spent about five years now building this application and the company and kind of, you know, helping educators, educational institutions to adopt social emotional learning using our platform. So my only kind of thought is that the power of gamification is huge, as we kind of know, and I know your audience knows it quite well. But when it comes to education, there are still a lot of apprehension people think whether it's going to be useful for them or whether they really can control their environment and which is why gameful practices is still not very widely popular in higher education i don't know if you have any different point of view there Rob, but that's what i've seen i mean for us when we are you know working with a new institution or new professors we find a lot of instructors are kind of quite apprehensive about introducing something which has gameful learning elements. There are some elements which are popular, like I would say social, um, you know, simulations and things like that. But there are so many ways we can, you know, implement gameful learning. So my only thing is just being open about it because there is a lot of value that can come out of gameful learning and kind of really speaking to that and, you know, giving it a try. I would say keeping an open mind and giving some of these tools a a try to see how it actually works and then hopefully being able to improve them to get the right outcome that you're looking for. So that's kind of my only thought I would kind of share there. And if you want to learn about Yellowdig, the best way to go is to our website, which is yellowdig.com, the color yellowdig.com. You will see a bunch of resources, what we do, how we help instructors to make the classes more engaging and fun, And if you want to contact us, it's very easy to find a link there and kind of reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. Fantastic, Shaunak. Very, very, very good. Great information. Great experiences that you've had. Thank you for joining us today on Professor Game Podcast, sharing all of that experience, that knowledge that you've gained through these years working with that platform. However, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Engagers, it's fantastic to have you around, and this podcast only makes sense with you, so let's go ahead and connect. For example, I use plenty my Twitter. There you can let me know who you'd like to be as a guest, if you have any questions, any help you need on the world of gamification, games-based solutions, and so on. And you can find my Twitter account on professorgame.com slash Twitter, where I'm constantly sharing content around the Professor Game podcast, which, as you know, is focused mainly on games, gamification, and education and learning. And before you click continue, before you move on to your next mission, remember to subscribe or follow absolutely for free using your favorite podcast app, and that way you will get the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.